go have a listen to the podcast. I run it with you, Gopnik, and Second Thought, and we have a great time talking about socialism, history, and general nonsense we encounter in our daily lives. I also talk about all the weird patients I see, so go have a listen. Hello. Why is the so-called first world rich? Why are third world countries poor? You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich. Mexico is rich. Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. But there's billions to be made there to be carved out and to be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European and North American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the cocoa, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, and the cheap labor. They have taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped, they're overexploited. Our Italian-American friend over there didn't lie. Let me introduce you to the concept of unequal exchange through a presentation of a fantastic research article that I highly recommend you read. Unequal exchange theory delivers the analysis that the economic growth in so-called advanced economies, think Germany, the US, Japan, etc., what's been referred to as the global north, relies by a large proportion on a significant net appropriation of resources and labor from the global south, think Kenya, Peru, the Philippines, etc. This appropriation reaches astronomical levels. In 2015 alone, the North appropriated 12 billion tons of embodied raw material equivalents, 822 million hectares of embodied land, 21 exajoules of embodied energy, and 188 million person years of embodied labor, worth $10.8 trillion in northern prices, enough to end extreme poverty 70 times over. Furthermore, Global South countries lose far more through unequal exchange than is made up by aid, by a factor of 30. Our analysis confirms that unequal exchange is a significant driver of global inequality, uneven development, and ecological breakdown. Let's get into the history. It should be no surprise that the rise of Western Europe was heavily bolstered by the forcible appropriation and extraction of natural resources and labor from the Global South during colonial periods. Spain extracted gold and silver from the Andes, Portugal extracted sugar from Brazil, France extracted fossil fuels, minerals, and agricultural products from West Africa. Belgium extracted rubber from the Congo. British extracted cotton, opium, grain, timber, tea, and countless other commodities from its colonies around the world, all of which entailed the exploitation of southern labor on coercive terms, including through mass enslavement and indenture. Both Europe, as well as the settler colonial societies established in the US, Canada, Australia, etc., directly derived their growth and industrialization of their economies through this form of appropriation, with the younger settler colonial nations reproducing similar imperialist orientations towards the global south. What about the ideology? Let's peel back the curtain a bit. The standard narrative is that after the withdrawal of colonial troops and political administrators, those colonial patterns of extraction ceased. The world economy today is meritocratic. If your nation has strong institutions, solid markets, and works hard, it will become wealthy. Likewise, poor countries are such because they lack the above. Reality is patently different. Rich countries and monopolistic corporations leverage their geopolitical and commercial dominance in the world economy to depress or cheapen the prices of resources and labor in the global south, both at the level of whole national economies as well as within global commodity chains. As a result, for every unit of embodied resources and labor that the South imports from the North, they have to export many more units to pay for it, enabling the North to achieve a net appropriation through trade. Essentially, unequal exchange allows for a hidden transfer of value from the Global South to the Global North, periphery to core. This takes place invisibly, without the overt coercion of the former colonial apparatus. The fundamental analysis within this paper deals with prices, which convention dictates representing utility, value, the outcome of market mechanisms such as supply and demand, while conveniently glossing over, or obscuring, the role that power imbalances in the global economy play. This is part of modern economic mythology that shifts the blame of underdevelopment onto the victims through maintaining similar patterns of appropriation that once defined colonial economy. 
Since the advent of neoliberalism, manufacturing has by majority been shifted to the global south. Despite this, the same pattern remains. A northern appropriation from the global south comprises, among other things, number one, resources and labor embodied in primary commodities, number two, manufactured goods, even high technology products like smartphones, cars, chips, etc., and three, intermediate parts. Most of this appropriation occurs through global commodity chains, wherein northern firms deploy monopsony and monopoly power to depress southern suppliers' prices at every node in the chain, from extraction to manufacture, while setting final prices as high as possible. The article in question attempts a quote-unquote footprint analysis of input and output data, basically a way of quantifying the scale of raw materials, land, energy, labor, etc. through the traded goods themselves, as well as all upstream resources and labor that goes into producing and transporting those goods, machines, factories, infrastructure, etc. Essentially, it's a novel way of carrying out the analysis even through complex global commodity chains. Calculating the physical scale of the embodied resources that flow between the global north and the global south needs definitions, unsurprisingly. Global North is defined according to the IMF's Advanced Economies Grouping, so USA, Canada, Western and Northern Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, amongst others. While all other countries, the IMF's Emerging and Developing Economies categorization, are classified as the Global South. Secondly, they measure direct and indirect trade flows between the two, through tracking four categories. Materials measured in raw material equivalents, land, energy, and labor. Through this analysis we see that, for every unit of embodied raw material equivalent that the South imports from the North, they have to export on average 5 units to pay for it, a ratio of 5 to 1. For land, the average ratio is also 5 to 1, for energy it's 3 to 1, and for labor it is 13 to 1. This pattern results in significant net flows of resources from the South to the North. So, in 2015 alone, the North's net appropriation from the South totaled, as mentioned before, 12 billion tons of raw materials, 822 million hectares of land, 21 exajoules of energy equivalent to 3.4 billion barrels of oil, and 188 million person-year equivalent of labor, equivalent to 392 billion hours of work. By net appropriation, these researchers mean that these resources are not compensated in equivalent terms through trade. They are effectively transferred for free. And this appropriation is not insignificant in scale. It's exactly the opposite. It comprises a very large share, on average about a quarter of the North's total consumption. The political, social, economic, and ecological consequences of this net appropriation are ridiculous. All these land, energy, raw material, and labor resources could be used for the needs of those economies in their own development, but instead is mobilized around servicing consumption in the global north. To put it in comprehensible terms, 21 exajoules of energy would be enough to cover the annual energy requirements of building out necessary infrastructure to ensure that all 6.5 billion people in the global south have access to decent housing, public transport, healthcare, education, sanitation, communication, etc., etc. 822 million hectares of land, which is twice the size of India roughly, would in theory be enough to provide nutritious food for up to 6 billion people, depending on land productivity and diet composition. That's also not mentioning the significant ecological consequences. Offset manufacturing and material use in overexploited nations accounts for more than 90% of biodiversity loss and water stress. Soil depletion, water depletion, chemical runoff, health impacts of particulate pollution, social impacts of exploitation, as in regional conflict, loss of non-renewable resources with no offset by investment in capital stock, etc, etc, etc. All of these environmental and other consequences of the North's consumption are shifted onto the South, effectively offshoring them. Excess resource consumption in the global North is a major driver of ecological breakdown, consuming four times over the sustainable threshold, and of which 58% is sustained by net appropriation from the global South. In consumption-based terms, the North is responsible for 92% of carbon dioxide emissions in excess of the planetary boundary, while the consequences harm the South disproportionately, inflicting drastic social and economic costs. The South suffers 82-92% to of the costs of climate change, and 98-99% to of the deaths associated with climate change. In a political statement, the living standards of the global north are sustained and made possible by the ecological and material exploitation and devastation of the global south. The breakdown of the study is as such. Drain from the south in 2015 amounted to $14.1 trillion when measured in terms of raw material equivalents, $5.1 trillion when measured in terms of land, $3.6 trillion when measured in terms of energy, and $20.3 trillion when measured in terms of labor. 
The best the researchers could say is that the value of the drain through unequal exchange in 2015 alone ranged between $3.6 trillion on the lower end and $20.3 trillion on the higher end. Drain from China alone, by the way, amounted to $2.4 trillion, comprising 22% of the net south-north flows. Between 1990 and 2015, the total drain sum amounts to $242 trillion. This windfall bears a stark and close resemblance to colonial forms of appropriation, albeit through different means. And of course, as previously mentioned, this amounts to roughly a quarter of northern GDP during the era. Let's discuss aid. Overseas development assistance is a benevolent-seeming strategy of international development in which governments of the Development Assistance Committee commit to spending 0.7% of their GDP on aid. Of course, this is an ideological game that obscures a horrifying reality. To quote, our results show that net appropriation by Development Assistance Committee countries through unequal exchange from 1990 to 2015 outstripped their aid disbursements over the same period by a factor of almost 80. In other words, for every dollar of aid the donors give, they appropriate resources worth $80 through unequal exchange. From the perspective of aid recipients, for every dollar they receive in aid, they lose resources worth $30 through drain. This further reinforces the point. So-called poor countries aren't poor because of internal failings or vaguely racist justifications. These countries are overexploited and charity is an ideological band-aid. A common objection is the claim of efficiency or labor form differences between the North and South that explains the differences seen above, supposedly. Southern production now spans every part of global commodity chains, from manual labor to managerial, engineering, logistical, IT, and other roles. Despite this, and I quote, wage disparities are nonetheless so extreme that highly skilled labor performed in the South may even receive lower pay than quote unquote unskilled labor performed in the North. The paper itself goes into depth about how measuring productivity by prices, which is the usual justification, amongst other things is fallacious, but regardless, real productivity differences are minimal if they exist at all, and can't explain wage inequalities on their own. Furthermore, the gap between unit labor costs in northern and southern economies demonstrates that the difference in wages is greater than the difference in productivity. In other words, wage inequalities exist not because southern workers are less productive, but because they are more intensively exploited, and often subject to rigid systems of labor control and discipline designed to maximize extraction. This is pretty much the major reason why northern firms offshore production to the south in the first place, because labor is cheaper per unit of physical output. International economic manipulation, let's discuss this. The main predictor of high export prices and net appropriation as a result is economic power internationally. In a term, basically, rich countries can maintain price inequalities because they're rich, simple as. Here's a long quote that explains this further, so pause if you'd like to read it. To summarize this section of the article, international economic manipulation is done through 1. Northern firms and countries leveraging monopsony and monopoly power to depress southern supplier prices while setting final prices artificially high. Number 2. Patents, of which 97% of all patents are held by corporations in the high-income countries. Number 3. Forcing people in the south to pay for access to resources they might otherwise have obtained much more affordably or even for free. Number 4. High-income nations exercising monopoly power in the institutions of international economic governance, with northern countries holding a majority of votes, for example, in the World Bank and the IMF, with the US holding veto power, etc. etc. Another example of this is in the World Trade Organization, where bargaining power is determined by market size, which enables high-income nations to set trade rules in their own interests. Number 5. Subsidized agricultural exports from the North, which undermine subsistence economies in the South, contributing to dispossession and unemployment, placing a downward pressure on wages. Number 6. Militarized borders, which preclude easy migration from South to North, thus preventing wage convergence. Number 7. Structural adjustment programs imposed by the World Bank and the IMF, which since the 1980s have cut public sector salaries and employment, rolled back labor rights, curtailed unions, and gutted environmental regulations, amongst many, many more. This, of course, doesn't even begin to mention active attempts which are successful in preventing the South from developing sovereign industrial capacity, meaning outside of subordinate positions in global commodity chains. Structural adjustment programs, free trade agreements, the various international economic and trade organizations that have forced governments of global South countries to remove tariffs, subsidies, and other protections for young industries, all of which are things the West in particular used in their development early on. Check out Hajun Chang's work on this topic. Of course, I won't elaborate on assassinations or direct sabotage, in this video. All of this prevents governments from carrying out something called import substitution, basically meeting a greater proportion of a country's total demand for goods through its own domestic production, which would improve their export prices and drive northern prices down. 
tax evasion and illicit financial flows as well, of course, which amounts to more than $1 trillion per year, likewise drain resources that could have been reinvested domestically, or which governments could otherwise use to build national industries. All of this is worsened by external debt service obligations, which drain government revenue and basically leave economic policy in the hands of creditors. Furthermore, structural dependence on foreign investors and access to northern markets forces southern governments and firms to compete with one another by cutting wages and resource prices in a race to the bottom. Simply put, the usual explanations of how and why imperial periphery countries are poor are little more than ideology. The biggest roles played are by structural power imbalances in the world economy, which ensures that labor and resources in the south remain cheap and accessible to international capital, while northern exports enjoy comparatively higher prices. As a result, a significant drain of labor and resources occurs from the south, not too different from colonial periods, with the only major difference being that the former system was explicitly coercive and the current one is implicitly coercive. As the authors say, cheap labor and raw materials in the global south are not naturally cheap, as if their cheapness was written in the stars, they are actively cheapened. The limitations slash further investigation section of the article discusses class and geographic inequalities within countries, resource consumption patterns and class background, corporate control of supply chains, and so-called internal peripheries within developed countries such as the US, all of which are possibilities for deepening the analysis. The call to action part discusses potential solutions along the lines of reparations for ecological debt and payments from the appropriators, the north to the south, amongst other things. In the end, they basically admit that capitalism is the fundamental issue here, and since class interests dominate, only revolution, socialism, and dedicated internal development of imperial periphery countries can solve the systemic international economic imbalance. I've made relevant videos about the above, so check those out. That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. It really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to Marcus Lanusam, Red Commissar, Adlan, Hamad Fahmi, Govia2000, Sushi Fushi, Victor Nguyen, Hackerman, Brisket, Eric Setterquist, Julian Kovacs, Weeb Trash, Messe Orlinski, N3Asu, Uga Booga, Jaybird, Chris Lissemily, Eater Dude, 420, Meiji, Noms Chomsky, Sean Stevens, Vegan Marxist, Jeremy Miller, Yuriton, Proleyev, Tomasz Olszewski, Luce Vader, Nicolo Guadagnolo, Shivaru, Salian, D, Furry Comrade, Mantis himself, Francis Fish, Gregory Samsa, Chemtrails Just Lines of Coke for Jesus, oh my god, Cthulhu on Ice, Dom, John Batakia, Ryan Brown, Box Cinnabon Badger, Prishtail, Will, Edwin Hermato, Venbug, Derek, Joseph Aboud, and Banana Man Ultimate. Thanks for watching.